Canadian currents, which have the effect of undermining their universal validity. My Lords, which keeps us awake at night? The prospect of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan or the prospect of a Russian invasion of Ukraine? Consider the disquieting possibility that both may happen on the same day by prearrangement. Uh, Lord Brown, in introducing this excellent debate, spoke about the, the coming together of the two great illiberal powers. It's a very real coming together. The, the, the largest military exercise the Chinese uh, have been, uh, been involved with, with another country was conducted last year in northwestern China with Russian troops. J-20 stealth bombers uh, uh, were, were used. And a signal was going out that the two countries that have the most to gain from overturning the current world order, uh, most to gain from a revanchist and autocratic alternative, are working together. And that same message, I think, has been heard on every continent and in every archipelago. I spent part of last month in Pakistan, my first visit, very beautiful country. But you see the spore of China everywhere, uh, of the Chinese military, of Chinese social... And, of course, Pakistan is a, a special case. Uh, their alliance with China uh, goes back a long way. They've always seen it as a counterweight to India. But I was nonetheless struck when I heard the Prime Minister of Pakistan, a man of very British sensibilities and, and education, saying that perhaps multi-party Western democracy, which had been held out as the only alternative, was inferior to the more meritocratic Chinese alternative. I don't think we'd have heard that 10 years ago. Certainly we wouldn't have heard it 20 years ago. We wouldn't have seen ambitious politicians learning Mandarin rather than English, or ambitious young army cadets studying at uh, the People's Liberation Army's university rather than aspiring to come to Sandhurst. Around the world, people hear the melancholy, long withdrawing roar of Western influence. We can sanction Lukashenko. It doesn't stop him kidnapping and murdering opponents or massing troops on the Ukrainian border. We can sanction Ortega. It doesn't stop him stealing the election in Nicaragua. The same has happened all over Nigeria, Burma. The only, the only uh, part of Lord Anderson's otherwise excellent speech, which I'd question, is when he said the jury was still out on whether Tunisia is a democracy. When I see troops in the street and parliament dissolved, I don't think the jury is still out. The last country that could have still been held to have been a success 10 years after the Arab Spring has again joined this rush to autocracy. Now, we should all guard against the availability heuristic, right? It's always possible to pick examples of what's going wrong. But it, it was interesting the way Lord Brown began by giving us an empirical assessment of how democracy is in retreat. And in addition to the source that he gave, almost everyone who studies this says the same thing. The Economist Intelligence Unit, Freedom House, the Democracy Index, seven years of solid advance at some point in the last decade have stalled and gone into reverse. And I want to explore why that's happened. Of course, part of it is simply that people no longer care as much about what the Western powers think. There's been a change in the balance uh, geostrategically. Part of it, frankly, is the, uh, the pandemic and the associated lockdowns, not just in the obvious sense that we gave up liberties, that we, we couldn't travel and, and we were uh, interned and so on, but also in, I think, the more, uh, the more dangerous and insidious sense that a common threat of that kind tends to make people more authoritarian. It's a well-observed psychological phenomenon, whether it's a, a war or a plague or a, a natural disaster. People coming out of it become more intolerant of dissent, more demanding of the smack of firm um, government, more demanding of uh, a strong man rule. But I wonder, and this is perhaps the most disquieting thought of all, whether in the scheme of things, it isn't the last couple of hundred years of, a, of democratic and liberal advance that are the exception. All the things uh, that various lords spoke about opposite the kleptocracy, the, 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 the institutionalized looting of, of state resources, the, uh, uh, the seizure of power by small elites, that was pretty much how every civilization was run for most of the last 10,000 years. The lot of almost every human being was servitude of one kind or another, backbreaking labor in the fields from dawn till dusk while small elites systematically looted the state. We are exceptionally lucky to be here in a place and at a time when we found mechanisms to keep the government under control and when a measure of law and liberty can flourish, when we've elevated the rules above the rulers. But that is not the normal state of play. And I wonder whether we might be coming towards the end of a brief interglacial between 
the long ice ages. And that's why it's so important to keep educating and to keep elevating this idea that process matters more than outcome, that the rules matter more than the rulers, that the individual matters more than the collective, and why we should keep a sense of perspective in attacking different parties within a democratic system. Because if we lose sight of those precepts, then the bleak landscape stretch ahead of us, dark and cold and grim.